Good morning, church. So very good to be with you on what is a unique thing. A day without rain. Almost two days in a row this summer. That's amazing. Um, Revelation chapter 1, if you have a Bible or a device by which to access the Bible, love to encourage you to grab it, pull it out, open up to Revelation chapter 1. As was mentioned, we are back in the study of this beautiful, powerful book. And I must say, it's incredibly wonderful to be back in this study with you as a church this morning. We began this study through the first five chapters with a theme. Does anyone remember that theme from earlier this year? Jesus loves church. Yeah, that's a good thing. He loves you. He likes you. He enjoys your presence. We see that all throughout that first section of the book of Revelation, that his love is revealed, revealed to us. Now, that word revealed, you may know, is an important word for the study of the book of Revelation. We may ask why. Well, Revelation, the title of this book, simply means the unveiling or the revealing or to uncover, to, to make manifest. And the book of Revelation, well, in chapter 1, verse 1, that's why we're there this morning, look at what the author says. John says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Revelation reveals, uncovers, makes manifest, shows us Jesus and the events that must soon take place. You see, in this book, and really this is the character of God, God's heart in this book is to reveal, not to conceal, God's heart in this book is not to necessarily overstimulate our minds with content, but the truth of his word and the truth of his character and his nature, that it would move us to worship. That's the purpose of this book. Warren Wearsby says this, God gives us the privilege of seeing the glorified Christ in heaven, the fulfillment of his sovereign purposes in the world. See, Revelation, he says, is the open book in which God reveals his plans and purposes to us, his church. Revelation, he says, is primarily the revelation of Jesus Christ, not just the revelation of future events. See, the seven churches that this book were, was written to, they were undergoing challenge, persecution, and John writes to encourage them with the truth of who Jesus is. And that's what we considered as we opened up this book earlier this year. Who is Jesus? Well, in chapter 1, look at a few of these verses that explain to us who the person of Jesus is in his glorified state. Verse 5, from Jesus Christ, he's the faithful witness to these things the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. That's who Jesus is. Look at verse 8, Jesus speaking. He says, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. I'm the almighty one. Look at verse 13 of chapter 1. John writing, he says, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, a title that was often given to Jesus throughout the Gospels. And he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head, it says in verse 14, and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face, his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. Chapter 1 shows us the person of Jesus. Jesus 
like verse 13 through 16, I would say he's glorious, wouldn't you? Like if you're strolling down the aisle of Walmart and you see a guy with that kind of description, you'd go, whoa, who is this guy? There's some glory to this guy. He's glorious. But also he's God. Verse 8, I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, I'm the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. That's not a description when you just meet someone and say, hey, hey, Sam, hey, Brenda, how are you? What are you about? Well, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. Go, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> These are bold claims. He's glorious. He's God. Verse 5. I'm an addicted alliterator. Here it is. <laughs> Jesus has got everything that is to come. He's got it. Verse 5. He's the faithful witness, the first to rise from the dead. And what does it say? the ruler of all the kings of the world. So what should this do to our hearts? Should it just kind of like overstimulate us with information or should it motivate us to worship and trust? Which, which one do you think is the right answer? Worship and trust. See, if you don't get this perspective of who Jesus is, the revelation of Jesus, he's God, he's glorious, and he's got this. Well, everything else might look a little troubling to you in the book of Revelation. But see, then in chapters 2 and 3, we don't just see the person of Jesus, but we see the people of Jesus. Now, this is a pop quiz. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. It rhymes with merch, but starts with a C. Who are the people of Jesus? And who is the church? Us. We are. His people. Bought by his blood. Brought into his family. Given this standing with God where we're his sons and his daughters, we're his kids, we're his people. You see, and in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we're given great insight into the love that Jesus has for you and for me. We're given seven letters written to seven churches. And in these letters, I really do believe we're given great insight into the tenderness of but also the toughness, the reality of God's love for you and I. Again, addicted alliterator, so here's what we see in those chapters. In each of the letters that we see, all seven of them have these similar components to the letters. Jesus identifies the church by name. I'm so thankful he knows each of us by name. You're not just a faceless name in a crowd. Jesus knows who you are, knows where you are. He names the church by name, and then he gives a characterization of himself that if you remember as we navigated those chapters together was perfectly appropriate and applicable to what they were going through. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He identifies them by name. He gives a characterization. Then he gives a commendation. I see what you're doing well. He, he gives a critique offers insight of what needs to be done better. He gives a command and counsel and then comfort. These are the ways those letters in chapters 2 and 3 unfold to us to reveal to us the love that Jesus has for his church. Chapter 1, the person of Jesus. He's God. He's glorious. He's got this. Chapters 2 and 3, Anyone remember who, what this one's about? It's another P rhymes with meeple. The people of Jesus. Yeah, you're learning stuff in church. Can you believe that that actually happens? You're learning stuff in church. The people of Jesus. Well, then what's happening in chapters four and five? These other two chapters that we've already considered thus far this year. It's the perspective where Jesus is. Jesus is in heaven. The perspective. Look at verse, oh, verse one of chapter four. Verse one of chapter four John writes this, As I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I'd heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. And the voice said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must happen after this. And we are given some insights. And let's just read a few of these insights that we see from this perspective of heaven. We see God's sovereignty, His holiness. Look at verse 8 of chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is to come. Look at verse 11. 
You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. God is sovereign. God is holy. Look at chapter 5, verse 12. Those singing sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then in verse 13 of that same chapter, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. This is the perspective we need as we step into chapter 6 on through chapters 19. You say, why? Well, the Father and the Son are central and supreme in this heavenly scene. And what are people saying? Gosh, is he making good choices? Are these good decisions? Has God thought this through, what's about to happen? You know what they're saying? Holy. Well, what you're doing is, is perfect. God, you're glorious. You're seated in places of honor and power, and this is what they're saying. And this is a good thing. Why do we need that perspective? Well, because now we step into a section of the book where things begin to get interesting. The temptation is to see or to believe that whoever is in control is anything but honorable, glorious, worthy, and that they're really in places of honor and power. So chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 speak very clearly to who Jesus is, how much he loves his people, and the perspective and the position of heaven. And seeing things from the end to the beginning, all those who see what God is doing say, God, you're right in all that you're doing. You're holy. It's perfect. Because now we'll see, as the series title kind of indicates for this fall, Jesus, full of mercy and justice. Over the next few months, we're going to see a tremendous amount of justice being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, I don't think we've done this before in our study of the book of Revelation. And, and I thought this was an appropriate point to speak to this point, that there are differing ways that people read the book of Revelation. Let, let me just share a few of them with you. One is the predictive futurist. Okay, don't forget that. That's going to be on the test before you leave. You don't get communion. No. Okay, what does that mean? Predictive, well, who is that? This view sees the text as a code that represents future events. The original meanings, they would say maybe, wasn't fully understood by its original audience and will only be revealed when the events happen. Okay? There's the preterist view. Oh, like the predator, the, the film? No, 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 no. This view sees the text as a code, but the events represented by the code has already happened, meaning everything you're reading in Revelation was specific to that first century, just spoke to them. Some view it that way. There's more of a poetic view or, or a theopoetic, like poetry, but with God at the center. And this view sees the poetic language used to express ultimate truths of God, evil, and history. Meaning that when you're reading this text, there's some that would say, well, it's really just a book of poetry and it's meant to just highlight how bad sin is and how good God is. Fourth, there's kind of a, a theopolitical, and this view sees the text as kind of like a political protest, a dissent against the Roman Empire at the time. In this view, the emphasis is placed on the kingdom of God as like the, the antithesis to all other kingdoms that have ever existed. And I guess you could say the last and fifth and final viewpoint would be what's called the prophetic or pastoral view. And this view sees the text as anchored in the past, but meant to speak to every generation. And the imagery is seen as challenge and comfort by showing us a heavenly perspective on the events of our world throughout time. So then the, here's the question. One, two, three, four, five. Which way is correct? I'll give you the NIV. Yes. <laughs> Say, what do you mean by that? Speak clearly to that. All five views identify something that is happening in the book of Revelation. 
Revelation functions as a lens, as a code, as a pointer towards future culminating events. As a code, Revelation maps historical events, past, present, and future. As a lens, the symbols in Revelation fit within a wider biblical drama showing how they apply across time. The author is reaching back to an Old Testament audience that's very familiar with the symbols and the scriptures. And he's speaking to them. And in a sense, Revelation is the culmination of all these design patterns that they see throughout the Old Testament history. See, here's the deal. The symbols point us toward a real culminating events leading to a new creation. The symbols aren't meant to just map precisely all the details of the future. I mean, is anything in life like that? When you're like, okay, when Neil's finally done, where do I go get lunch today? Oh, there it is. No. Instead, they help us live in all ages in light of the coming new creation. That's what Revelation does for us. See, I really do personally resonate and appreciate with, with author Jeff Lacine. I'm going to put it up on the screen. This is what he says about the next 14 chapters we're about to jump into. He says, the next 14 chapters, or nearly two-thirds of Revelation, are devoted to describing the tribulation period, the greatest sorrow and judgment this world will ever experience is coming, the tribulation. In the Old Testament, it's commonly called the day of the Lord. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble because of the severe persecution that Israel will face, particularly in the final three and a half years. He says the entire seven-year period depicts what is going to take place on earth following the removal of God's people and the rapture of the church and the end of tribulation reaches its climax in the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, this is our focus for the next three and a half months. We're going to take one chapter a week, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, all the way through chapter 19, and here's what we're going to see. Today's message is kind of an overview of what's coming. We're going to see God's justice, that which has been prophesied for hundreds of years, even before Christ's arrival onto the scene, being poured out to the world. We're going to be given amazing descriptions in these next few chapters of the Antichrist, what's known as the false prophet, the 144,000, a great earthquake, these two witnesses, symbols and signs of what's known as the woman and the dragon, the earthly battle of chapter 13, a description of the army of the Lamb and a call to repentance. That's what we're going to see over the next few months. We'll see the seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven bowls that are connected. The seventh seal introduced the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet introduces the seventh bowl. And you may say, what are these seals, trumpets, and bowls? Well, there's two primary schools of thought on this. Number one, that some people see this as three sequ sequential series of end-time judgments that increasingly get worse and harder and more difficult and more devastating. They just kind of fall like dominoes. A second perspective sees that each of the seven describes the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and return, but from three different perspectives. I like what David Guzik says about this. He says, there are many different options, but it seems best to say that the seals, trumpets, and bowls that will be described later are not strictly sequ sequential events. It could be said that chronologically, the trumpets do not follow the seals and the bowls do not follow the trumpets in strict order. You say, what are you talking about? No matter what school of thought you swim in, or where you land on the dynamics of these judgments that are being poured out. Here is the point of what you're going to see as we consider these chapters, specifically chapters 6 through 16, as they focus on these seals and these bowls and these judgments. There is judgment for sin. That's what's being said. But there's always mercy. What do you mean? An opportunity and a call to repentance. 
Let me see if I can share with you what we're going to see in these different chapters as it relates to the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Now, if you're still awake and with me, let me know by saying Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Okay, that's good. If you believe that in your heart, you just confessed it, welcome to the family, right? That's what the Bible says. Listen, I want to share with you in just a moment what these trumpets and seals and bowls are. I'm going to read them to you to give you a sense of an overview. In chapter 6, through the beginning of chapter 8, we see what's known as the seven seals. Here they are. Verses 1 and 2, the appearance of the Antichrist. Verses 3 and 4, what's known as great warfare. Verses 5 and 6, there's famine. There's plague. There's a martyrdom of believers. There's an earthquake recorded in verses 12 through 14 causing terrible devastation and astronomical upheaval. In fact, look at verse 16 of chapter 6 because things are so hard at this point, so horrific. Look at the response of those who survived these first six seals. Verse 16 of chapter 6 says, They cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to survive? Now, this is all chapter 6. This is the message that Pastor John will be sharing next week. So invite your friends. It's going to be a super cheery message, right? <laughs> like, this is the dynamic. This is what's coming. And in chapter 6, it unpacks these seals that are being opened. Well, chapter 8 through 11, we see what's described as the seven trumpets. Well, what are those? Let me read them to you. Chapter 8, verse 7 talks about hail and fire that destroy much of the plant life in the world. Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 8 speak of death of much of the world's aquatic life. Verse 12, a darkening of the sun and moon. In chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, there's like this plague of demonic locusts. I know what that is. I live in northwest Florida. I've seen those. No, but there's the march of this army that kills a third of humanity in chapter 9, verses 12 through 21. And then the seventh trumpet calls for the seven angels who carry out the seven bowls of God's wrath. We see that in chapters 15 through 16. And here's what those bowls include. Verse 2 of chapter 16, painful sores. Verse 3, finally the death of every living thing in the sea. Verses 4 through 7, turning rivers to blood. Verses 8 and 9, an intensifying of the sun's heat, or as known as June in northwest Florida. Great darkness and an intensification of sores. The advance of the Antichrist and his armies in chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. And a devastating earthquake followed by giant hailstones. That, that closes out chapter 16. Now again, different ways of looking at this. Are these all just sequential events that just happen like dominoes? Or is it a perspective to go, man, things are tough. And all these things are happening at that time. The Lord knows. But there's something I want to draw your attention to. And we're going to come back to this as we close our message in just a little bit. But as the third angel of these bowls is pouring out judgment, it's in verse 7 of chapter 16. I want you to look at what this angel says. After we've just heard of all these horrendous dynamics that are happening due to the judgment of sin, verse 7 of chapter 16, one of the angels says this, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. One who is sent as a messenger, one who is sent by God and sees everything that's happening, he says, this is, this is just. This is true. That's chapters 6 through 16. 17 through 19 very briefly, here's what we see. Babylon in chapter 17 and 18 is carefully described. Say, so what does that mean, Babylon? The concept of Babylon is, is greater than what's detailed in these chapters, and it includes even more than simply the reign of Antichrist. Babylon has been present throughout history. 
And at the time that John was writing, Babylon was typified by Rome. In our day, it's typified and seen by the world system that we live in. But what's at the heart of this? It's nations rising and relying on their economic, military, and pseudo-spiritual power and influence and demanding allegiance to that in thought and action. That's what it is. It's nation first. It's this concept that there's a kingdom that we can build on earth and which we will give our allegiance and trust to. But under Antichrist, Babylon, both in its religious and commercial aspects, will have influence over the entire globe like it's never seen before. Isn't that at the heart of what God's after? What? Your heart. See, a healthy heart is one of the best representations you'll ever see in the term described as dad, citizen, employee, employer, author, custodian, whatever position. What God is after is your heart. And when he changes your heart, your first allegiance goes to him. And then every other aspect in your life, you give your best to. But you recognize that first and foremost, I'm living for a kingdom that's not of this world. And that's the battle. That's the struggle that you'll see in these chapters is that there's those that would rise up through this concept of Babylon that will demand allegiance in thought and actions to their economic, their military, their pseudo-spiritual might. And in chapter 19, we'll see this final battle, which in all honesty isn't a bloodbath at all. It's Jesus returning with the sword of his mouth, and he defeats the armies of the Antichrist. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. And only when all these judgments run their course and come to an end, Will Jesus return and usher in what's known as the millennial kingdom, a time of peace on earth? That's chapters 6 through 19. Intense stuff for the fall. I'm looking forward to having David Guzik here in a month to bring clarity to all of it, aren't you? That was strategically timed. Let's bring this guy and let him come. Let him share a little bit. If you don't know what that is, in, in about a month or so, we're hosting a, an Enduring Word weekend, a Friday night, a half day Saturday, and a Sunday morning with, with a friend and pastor named Pastor David Guzik of EnduringWord.com. And he's going to come and just give kind of an overview of everything that we're sharing. Because as you can see, maybe you don't agree, but I think it's intense. It's intense. So I'm so thankful for that weekend. I hope that you're able to join us at that time. But I want to draw your attention back as we begin to kind of kind of close this morning. Remember verse 7 of chapter 16. The angel said, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. All that is being described in these chapters, the death, the judgment, the response is yes, true, just. Why is this recorded here? I want to share something from a couple different authors. One is Warren Wiersbe. He says this, It seems strange to us that worship and judgment should go together. But this is because we do not fully understand either the holiness of God or the sinfulness of man. Nor do we grasp the total picture of what God wants to accomplish and how the forces of evil have opposed him. God is long-suffering. But eventually, must judge sin and vindicate his servants. And this is why I wanted to read this. It gives us this perspective. He says, according to Daniel 9, seven years are assigned to Israel in God's prophetic calendar, beginning with the signing of an agreement with a world dictator, the Antichrist, and ending with Christ's return to earth to judge evil and establish his kingdom. It is this period described in Revelation 6 through 19. See, God is so good and so gracious that he made a way for you and I to not have to experience his judgment and separation from him. That solution has a name. His name is Jesus. At the end of our service this morning, I know of no better physical, tasty description than communion 
to preach that message of seeing mercy and justice meet. One author once said this, the cross of Jesus Christ is where mercy and justice kiss, where God pours out his judgment upon sin on someone who did not deserve it, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, the holy one, so that you and I could be shown the mercy of God. We get to live Jesus' life because he died our death. And sometimes it's easy in the 21st century to kind of, as Wearsby says here, not fully grasp the gravity of sin or the holiness of God. One day we will. Revelation 6 through 19. When God's long suffering has come to an end. But now we live in an age of grace. We are called by his spirit to respond in repentance and faith, to trust Jesus to be your savior. That time is now to experience his mercy. Chuck Swindoll, another pastor, says this about this section of scripture. He says, for the bulk of its 66 books, that's how many books are in the Bible. The Bible portrays a world deep in the throes of suffering. Human beings have had a problem with sin since the fall in Genesis 3. And verse after verse has recorded our problem in painstaking detail. The brilliance of Revelation is that it provides a final answer to this problem, a hope that Jesus will once and for all heal all the wounds wrought by sin. Jesus will reign for a thousand years and then recreate the world in a place that represents God's original design. The Bible's narrative is very simple, creation, fall, recreation. But without the completion of the redeeming work of Jesus recorded in Revelation, we wouldn't have the end of the story, leaving our hope for the future in serious doubt. See, the point is clear. The book of Revelation has tremendous future application. Application concerning the future that reaches back to the whole of Scripture to clearly show who Jesus is. Remember verse 5 of chapter 1? Jesus, the faithful witness, the first to rise from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the world, he's got this. Chapter 1, verse 8, the alpha and the omega, that he's God. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, that he's glorious. See, there's very much a futuristic dynamic to this study, but we also must remember that John was actually authoring this letter to, to real people and real churches in a real time. And when the Apostle Paul was living and pastoring in the city of Ephesus, he was arrested and exiled to an island of Patmos. That's where he wrote this book. And it was there that he received these visions and recorded this book. And when he was arrested, the churches around that region, all seven of them that this is written to in chapters two and three, began to feel the effects of persecution. One author says this, to those churches, Revelation provided a message of hope. God is in sovereign control of all the events of human history. And though evil is often seems pervasive and wicked men all powerful, their ultimate doom is certain. Christ will come in glory to judge and to rule. If you're a Christian this morning, how many of you would say amen to that? Amen. Yes. There is going to be an end to sin, to misalignment, a lack of justice that's coming. Amen. Another author I read this week says this, most believers have been taught that Jesus is coming soon, suddenly, unexpectedly. The soonness or the immediacy of Jesus' return is a powerful, promised hope of every generation. But a ra reality, it's only one. Believers must live as if he's coming tomorrow, but plan and implement the Great Commission as if he tarries. And that's where I want to close this morning. Say, so what do you mean by that? The good news of Jesus is mercy and justice. We'll remember and celebrate this morning through communion that in justice, the price was paid on our behalf because of Jesus through the cross. In mercy, we receive forgiveness from God because justice has been satisfied on our behalf. But like this quote shares, 
that we should implement the Great Commission. You may be new to church and say, what's the Great Commission? To be about seeing other people come to know Jesus, to be baptized in his name, to be taught the scriptures so that they could learn the word, so to live the word. That, we call that disciple making. That, that's our business as believers. We implement the Great Commission through living out the gospel message of forgiveness. You know, I was speaking to a few staff members about this sermon series, and I asked them to share an example that has impacted them personally of justice and mercy. And one of the members of the team shared how it's always impacted them that this story, actually a story from right here in Gulf Breeze, of a mother who lost her daughter in a DUI-related accident, and seeing that mother extend mercy and forgiveness to a man who still had to serve justly his punishment. And this is how I want to close this morning. I've given you a lot of content this morning. How many of you would agree with that? Go, wow, that was my first time here. <laughs> See you never. You know, like, <laughs> well, that's not always how it is, but like, we wanted to give you an overview of what's coming. So like next week you show up and you go, wow, what, where are we? What is happening here? Chapter six. We're going to see over the next few months judgment, but we're also going to see mercy. What's our role in that? I think one is to be informed, to, to know God's word. Be able to have clarity that Jesus truly is God, that Jesus truly is, he's got this and he's glorious. It's, our, it's important that we know that as believers and that we're not ignorant of his word, but we know his word. But also, as this author shares, to implement the great commission until he tarries, to live in that expectancy of his arrival, but also to know that our business as believers is to see people know Jesus, follow Jesus, be like Jesus. How do we do that? Well, I want to share with you a little bit of that story that I just read about this mother that happened right here in Gulf Breeze nearly 20 years ago as an example of what our response can be to the truth of God's word and how to live in that balance of mercy and justice. And after that video, Pastor John's going to come and just prepare our hearts and give us some instruction for a time of communion. But let's take a look at the screen. And I want you to watch this illustration as an example of how to walk in forgiveness and how mercy and justice can meet. The news came out of nowhere in the middle of the night, the deadliest time to be on the roads. She just looked at me and said, there's been an accident. It was Megan. She didn't make it. And that's when my whole world just absolutely fell apart. Renee Napier awakened May 11, 2002 to the news that one of her twin daughters, Megan, and Megan's friend Lisa Dixon had been killed in a car crash in Gulf Breeze. The driver who hit them was drunk. Anger for me came um, pretty quickly. That anger was directed at this man, 24-year-old Eric Smallridge. Two people had just lost their life based on a very flawed decision on my part. Renee says she was filled with rage at Eric and at God. And I used to talk to him in my car and say, you need to show up right here in my seat, send somebody, send an angel, send somebody to explain this to me. No explanation came, but a realization did. She realized that to survive herself, she had to forgive. So where do you go to find that place deep inside where anger and forgiveness live side by side? And what do you do when you get there? The answer came the day Eric was sentenced to 22 years in prison as Renee was giving her victim's impact statement. She actually stopped and looked over at me and the words that came next were not anything that I expected. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, Eric, I forgive you. So that is where it all started. It became a remarkable friendship between the two. Then, about nine years into Eric's sentence, the Napier and Dixon families went before the judge on Eric's behalf and requested a reduced sentence. Eric was released just a few months later. But I know that it changed my life completely. Thank you. Following his release, Eric and Renee teamed up to spread the message of the dangers of drinking and driving. Not only for you, and it can't only take away your life, but it can take away the lives of others. 
They speak at high schools and civic groups across the country. Their story even inspired the hit Christian song, Forgiveness. It's the hardest thing to give away and the last thing on your mind today. Renee says Megan would have loved the song and would approve of the way her family and the Dixons have turned forgiveness into an action book. You have to say the word, forgiveness. There's so much power um, to heal from being able to forgive. On the road, in Gulf Breeze, Drexel Gilbert, News 5.